thank you everyone for joining us for this month's learning collaborative. This month we will be focusing on virtual simulation. And to get us started, I would like to introduce Dr. Vernell DeWitty to facilitate today's webinar. Dr. DeWitty, please take it away. Thank you very much, Jasmine. And good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the August HBCU Learning Collaborative. On behalf of the leadership and staff at the Center to Champion Nursing in America, I thank all of you for taking time to join us this afternoon for a very important discussion. The Future of Nursing Campaign for Action is happy to bring today's webinar focused on virtual simulation. I think that you will all agree with me that this is a very timely topic for discussion in today's environment. Before we go much further, I want to share with you that we are recording today's webinar. So if you miss a section or you would like to go back and review it or to send it to a colleague, you can find the recording by going to www.campaignforaction.org forward slash webinar. I now have the honor of introducing today's presenters. To save on time, I will not read their full biographies, but their biographies are available on our website along with today's recording. Our first presenter is Dr. Teresa Gore, who is a professor at the University of South Florida College of Nursing. Our second presenter will be Dr. Kelly Bryant, who is the Executive Director of Simulation and Assistant Professor at Columbia University School of Nursing, Helene Falls Health Trust Simulation Center. Our last presenter today will be Dr. Gia Daniel, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Emory University. Our key objectives for today's seminar are as follows. One, to provide purpose, standards, expectations, and requirements for virtual simulations. Two, to provide program perspective, implementation, and recommendations for virtual clinical simulations. And three, to introduce and provide a walkthrough of a sample of available virtual clinical simulation programs. With that, I would like to thank you for joining us today. And Dr. Gore, please take it away. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is having a great day. And welcome to this webinar. And we all hope that you great you gain some knowledge to help your students to be successful. I'm here to talk to you about the unactual standards of best practice simulation so that we can go over what is really needed to have a simulation that is valuable and can have positive outcomes. Next slide. I have no disclosures. Okay, so one of the things that we look at is when we're having simulations is that we want to provide participants with the purpose of the simulation. We'll have the standards that will be incorporated in the simulation. We'll have expectations for the learners, and there'll also be expectations that you can look at for your facilitators and what is required for virtual clinical simulation for the best outcome. Next. Okay, so our standards. In 2011, uh, we published the first standards for simulation best practice, and then in 2013 and 2016, we have revised them. And this year, at the end of 2020, we will come out with the newly revised standards. We keep developing our standards and updating them so that we can use the best evidence out there to translate it into practice. We have standards on simulation design, we have it on outcomes and objectives, facilitation debriefing, persistent evaluation, professional integrity, simulation enhanced and professional education, the simulation operations, and that's what you would need to run your simulation center. It kind of gives the guidelines, and that uh, goes with the AACN 
um, dab arms for simulation also. And we also have the simulation glossary so that we can look at when we're reading an article or reading a manuscript, you can look and make sure that the definitions are standardized so that you can repeat study and understand that work. Next one. So as we get to this, this is one of the infographics. At a NACPO, we do have the infographics that are available, and the standards are uh, freely accessible if you go to the NACPO website. You can download each one of the standards so that you are able to have these, and then you can look at them and use those in your program. So one of the things is when we start with a simulation, we need to look and see what the needs are. So you need to conduct a needs assessment to determine if you need the high priority and low frequency or high frequency and medium priority. So this is one way that you can look at and make sure that all of your learners have had the opportunity to use um, their critical thinking skills and have the clinical experience in the simulations across the board. When you look at your area to determine which one of these disease processes that the students need to look at. And usually it is COPD, asthma, you look at heart cells, diabetes. So those are the ones that we, I can usually tell you that we all look at. And then we have the OBGYN, which is usually a postpartum hemorrhage. We have pediatrics, and a lot of that is asthma. And we've done a sickle cell with that patient population also. So once you determine the needs of each one of the programs, then you look and when it, and this goes for any one of your, um, hold on, I just lost my screen. So you look at the needs assessment and that will tell you um, what you want to measure. So you have to have measurable objectives. They need to be smart objectives. They need to be um, specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be attainable. They need to be realistic. And then um, they need to be time sensitive. So they need to make sure that they can be accomplished within the time that you have for each student to do their simulation. And this is not the objective that we share with the student. Students would get an overall objective, and then the simulation has simulation specific objectives. We can always tell a student that they'll be taking care of a heart failure patient. And in the simulation specific ones, you would look at it and say that they needed to have uh, identified that there was an extra heart sound, that they had degrowthiness distension, or that they had edema. And these can be easily portrayed when you're looking at having a virtual simulation because you can have that um, through the virtual you can have the heart sounds, the lung sounds. You can have all of that to make it easier for the students to identify this. The next one is the format. Is this a format as you're going back? Can your students come to the lab, or are you going to have this as a tabletop or facilitated on a computer? So that is one of the ones that's important is what do you need? Do you need all mannequins? Can this be portrayed with standardized patients? So that's how you would look at that to determine which one is the best. And we all have to do a lot of juggling to make sure that we get our students this uh, learning opportunity when we had to go into the isolation and staying at home with COVID. So this is when you can look, and as you're building simulations, you can look to see if they are a good, if they would be good for a format of virtual simulation. Then you have to look at the case or the scenario, and this is when I advise people as they're developing to use a template, and the template would have the necessary information or have the um, identified what you need to build this, because the more in depth you build your backstory and you do storyboarding, then it, the easier it is for you to collect all this information and make sure that you have the information to support the patients and the students in their learning opportunity. Then we look at fidelity. If it is a tabletop, 
then you can have a lot more fidelity in the film and uh, demonstrating if they have edema. Uh, the thing that would be missed is the easy communication that would make it harder for some students. Um, or having to type in instead of just speaking would make it more difficult. So you have to look at the fidelity. You need to complete the objective for the fidelity available for whichever format that you choose. The next one is the facilitation. The more that the student does not know what they do not know, that's for your beginning learners, you have to facilitate more. So you do not give these uh, students a large simulation that is very complex. You start with the, um, the basics, and then you build on these, and that can come through unfolding case studies, and a lot of the virtual students will have that. And so that's one of the things um, when your students do not understand yet and have not had the ability to practice it, and this is the first practice, then there will be more facilitation needed because the the learners have a lot more of a gap, and so they do need to know um, what they're doing, and you may have to take a time out and ask them some questions so that they're able to understand where they are and choose their next step. And then when you get to the next one, um, you have to have the prep, and you need to have your um, – what you need is your list of everything, all of your props, uh, what have they had in class, and what do um, and what do they need. If a piece of equipment is not working as you get into it, this is one of the things you'll have to let the students know. We get into the pre-briefing, and this is where you set the stage. And this is the part that we're finding that needs a lot of work now. You need to let and build a, um, a safe environment. So the way I do, I start with the students and I ask them, do they learn better from their successes or their struggles? And most of the time they will say they learn the best from their struggles. And I let them know that they're going to have a learning opportunity, that if it was everything that they could do perfect, it wouldn't be a great learning experience and they wouldn't be challenged. And I would rather them learn with a mannequin or with a virtual simulation than to learn on an actual patient. So you set the, the kind of the, the guidelines, the tone. You let them know, and you can orient them to the area. And you would not expect the student to be able to go in and perform in a simulation if they have not ever been on that platform for a virtual simulation or they have never been into the simulation room. So it is very important that you orient them, let them know that you would either have to type or you would talk, and that uh, virtual film would uh, supply you with answers. And you would have to let them know kind of the rules. And one of the best things is to do this in small groups at first, where people learn how to work with a virtual simulation. But you still have to do the same pre-briefing. And you can have take-home work for the students in the pre-briefing. You will determine which lectures they will need to have listened to, if any skills that they have developed, which skills need to be developed before they go into the simulation, and what you want them to obtain. They go through the simulation. After the simulation, there must be a timed debriefing. This means that you must allow specific enough time and a certain amount of time for debriefing to occur. One of the things is, is we don't want it to say uh, that you have a 20-minute simulation and a 10-minute debriefing. You need to have your debriefing at least as long as the simulation, if not longer. A lot of the debriefing and the learning occurs during this process. So there are some schools that actually take and video the debriefing session. This is great for a couple of reasons. The students can see where they made those connections and what they need to work on, the way that they look and do their needs assessment for themselves, and the facilitators. The facilitators can look at their own debriefings, and then they can see what they need to work on. The debriefing methodology needs to be a methodology where they have a chance to use an educationally uh, theory used for the uh, debriefing, and there are only 
Yeah. So this was, was the objective when I was talking about the objectives that they needed to be smart objectives and that they be appropriate for the level. And you can look at different domains. And they need to be evidence-based practice so that you can achieve it in that time frame. Go to the next. So um, we get the, um, the briefing that they go through, and um, they will be able to learn. And it's the way that you can actually have that one school actually has the debriefing. And the, um, the faculty selects two different debriefings from the entire year, and that is used in their evaluation if they're simulation faculty. The last thing that you really look at as you're planning this is the evaluation. The, about the participants need to be evaluated, whether it is summative or formative. They need to be able to evaluate the facilitator. Did they have and make a safe learning environment? And they actually need to evaluate the simulation. Uh, this is when we identify certain areas that the students are seeing that could be worked on and could be better. So that is an area that you can look at for that. And the last part of this is that you run a pilot test. The pilot test lets you know uh, where you have any gap. And this is done before the students get together and look at it. So the pilot test, you can do this and use senior nursing students uh, to go through it. Or later on, if you're building a new simulation and the, the group will not be graded on it, then when you run that through, and that will let you know if you have gaps. You can run it through with other faculty that do not know the specific also. And then one last slide, and this just gets into a little bit more of the objectives. And this is the most important part. I love to stress this one. Objectives, how do you know where to go and where you're going to end if you don't have that insight? So when you start a trip, you map that trip out. That is how we do with our objectives. And I wouldn't want to give a code situation, a code blue, uh, to a first semester nursing student. So you have to make it correct. You address a different domain. You want to make sure, and I map all of mine to our program objectives, and I also map them to the NCLEX blueprint to make sure that areas, um, test tubes always come up as one of the areas that our students need to work on some, so I try to have a simulation for that. And that's my time, and I have enjoyed this. I could talk the whole hour just on the standard, mm -hmm. but I know that uh, Dr. Bryant has a lot to say, and so I pass off to her. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gore, for that presentation. And thank you, Devin and Dr. Lee, for inviting me to present today. Next slide. So what we're going to talk about in this brief uh, meeting is um, discuss implementation of virtual simulation. We're going to talk a little bit about strategies to use the notion to promote cultural awareness. And lastly, we're going to summarize how do you evaluate students using virtual simulation. Next slide. So all of us as nurse educators, we have to really change the way we deliver our nursing curriculum once COVID hit. And I remember the day like it was yesterday, March 9th, everything just uh, went to virtual remote in a matter of, you know, a short time period, and we had to work very quickly. We had, you know, our closure of our academic setting. And then we're like, well, how are we going to have these students meet their outcomes? Because we were right almost, you know, a little bit more than um, end of our semester. Um, and we need to figure out how do we meet these outcomes for clinical practice and simulation now doing it remotely since they were no longer allowed to come on campus. They weren't allowed to finish their clinical in a hospital setting. So we really had to think, what are those strategies that we're going to use? And we thought remote, obviously. We also had opportunities to do hybrid simulation, which we'll talk about, and uh, lastly, screen-based simulation programs. Um, once we figured that out, we had to figure out how are we going to implement this. You know, there's a lot of resources out there right now for screen-based simulation, for example. How do you choose the best program? How do you know the best program for your nursing program? You know, we have seven nurse practitioner programs, and after doing a review, one size doesn't fit all. It wasn't just one program that works for everyone. So we had to fully evaluate it using an evaluation rubric to figure out which route we were going to go. And then we had to train the faculty. We had to train the students on how to use the software program. And then we had to figure out how are we going to integrate this into curriculum? How are we going to grade it? Um, and then lastly, um, evaluation. 
we had to um, also, even though we were thrust into this in a matter of a week or two, we still wanted to make sure it isn't meeting our outcomes for our course, for our, for our program. So we wanted to make sure all these outcomes affected. And then um, the surprise was, although we had to, you know, change our curriculum due to this emergency, there were a lot of positive things that came out of this. And what are those things that we're going to maintain and keep even as we reopen this fall? Next slide. So as we know, a lot of health care person practice nursing, we have three components. We have the didactic, we have the clinical, and then we have simulation. And within simulation, we have different methods of delivery. We have um, patient simulators, which are mannequins. We have standardized patients, which we use a lot of in our program. We have task trainers, and now we're going with this one with uh, realm extended reality, which I won't get into too much during the discussion. Next slide. So one of the first um, methods, that, um, strategies that we took was to really look to see which simulation screen-based program we were going to use. As everyone else, we moved to teleconferencing software, and our school would use Zoom. So we had to figure out, okay, what can we do via Zoom to have our students meet those outcomes and still get that simulation experience? So there's different ways that you can use screen-based simulation programs. If you want to do it synchronously with a facilitator, you can, um, we had, um, later on, maybe about a month after COVID, we were, as the instructors, allowed to be back on campus. However, the students were not allowed. So we were actually in our simulation um, room as a facilitator, and we played the role of the student. And we live streamed the simulation, and we had small groups of about six students or so watching while we were in the simulation room. And we had them kind of dictate to us what they wanted us to do during that simulation. For example, we had a pediatric asthma case. We gave them all the free briefs that we would give them if they were on campus. We gave them their free some assignment, and then it was simulation time. So instead of them being in the room, it was the facilitator, us, that we were in the room. And we went to the students via Zoom and said, okay, here's the vital signs you're seeing all this, you know, the chart, the lab. What do you want us to do? So they were able to really um, still participate in the simulation, even though they weren't doing it hands-on. They were directing us on what the nursing interventions and how to prioritize care. So it was still giving them some sort of that simulation experience where they had to critically think and had to make clinical decisions. Um, so that was one way that we can do it synchronously using Zoom. Using Another way is that we used some of the commercial-based simulation programs, and we were able to live stream that with a facilitator and have the students again kind of guide us through that simulation as the students, and we simply were a facilitator and kind of clicking and making um, the decisions for the students using the screen-based simulation program. And then you have asynchronous, um, where students on their own time, on their own computers, they can participate in screen-based simulation programs, which gives um, a lot of them have an evaluation tool built in, so they're able to share that tool when they're done and can let the, uh, their instructor know how well they did on that simulation. Um, and some of them even give the students a grade. There's all my case studies that they can do on their own, and then there's even mobile applications now that students can participate in simulation or skills. Next slide. So one of the things we were really careful about is that we wanted to maintain as much of the aspect of the simulation that we were doing in person um, via remotely. So we knew that the advantage is that we really wanted a full, comprehensive patient encounter. We wanted to evaluate their competency and their clinical knowledge of payment. And we also wanted to, um, again, make sure that what we were doing was going to enhance the students' clinical reasoning, critical thinking, situational awareness, the communication, teamwork. So these are all things that we had to keep in mind as we decided which way, which um, teaching strategy we wanted to use. Because we didn't want it to simply be you know, practicing a skill or practicing just one component. We really wanted to be comprehensive. Next slide. So there are a lot of commercial programs out there. Um, these are some of the popular ones, um, some of them that we chose to use that are um, more of the giving you the full simulation experience um, in regards to patient scenario and all those, those um, skills that we want the students to enhance. However, just like anything else, it is, it is, Expensive. You know, some of these programs cost as much as a hundred dollars per student. We felt that in the middle of this crisis, with everything else the students were going, um, that was going on, we didn't want to put the burden of that price on our students. So we found grants, we found ways to pay for it for our students. And luckily, these proceeds organizations, companies knew that 
you know, this was hard time. So a lot of them were giving out deals, and some of them still are, and discounts. Um, some of them were giving out free trials. So we were able to, to really take advantage of that um, in the beginning of COVID. Next slide. And then there's a lot of free resources out there. Not everyone has the luxury of being able to afford to pay $100 a license for their students. So, um, so it's just to note that it doesn't always require money to have a valuable um, screen-based simulation program. Medscape, for example, has very great, and it has hundreds and hundreds of cases where students can go on and there's video clips, there's quizzes embedded, it's very interactive, it's engaging, and it's absolutely free. However, these are for the nurse practitioner, uh, PA, for advanced um, students, not necessarily for the um, pre licensure registered nurse students. Next slide. And they do offer um, continuing education also. And then one of the things that I was definitely surprised is that, again, we had a very strong standard education um, program. Uh, because we are a graduate program, we use them a lot, um, even more so than American. And we were surprised to find that we could still maintain our standard education cases by having the standard education at home and using Zoom. We created meeting rooms. The students would go in and they would do their history. Um, they would ask some questions. We would um, provide diagnostic test results. And then they would look at it, come up with a diagnosis. And then they were able to go back and talk to that patient, so like telehealth, telemedicine, tell them their diagnosis and treatment plan. The only thing that was missing, they couldn't do a hands-on um, exam, but we found ways around that, like um, writing out the exam that they would do or talking through the exam. But we were, um, again, happy that we were able to still maintain these telehealth um, scenarios. Next slide. And then we'll talk a little bit about the skills. So we know that nursing is not only about skills, but it is the component of becoming a nurse is learning those psychomotor skills. And that's probably one of the toughest areas that we had to figure out. How do you do that remotely? So some of the things that we did, and, and nothing, you know, it's not the same as being hands-on and in, a, in your simulation kind of practicing, but we did have what we call virtual pa uh, practice sessions where we had the instructor actually in the simulation lab with all the staff trainers, and we had the students on Zoom, and they would ask um, the instructor um, skills that they wanted demonstrated. So we would do live demonstrations, and again, I know it's not the tactile being able to do the skills, but they were still able to see it. There's something to be learned about watching it. And then to keep it up a notch, we also had times where we asked the students to talk us through how to do a skill, such as, you know, urinary catheter uh, insertion. We also got creative. There were certain um, skills where we could mail the students. For example, suturing. We were able to mail these suture kits to the students. They could practice at home. We can have the um, instructors via Zoom demonstrating how to do the skills. The students could be doing it at home, take themselves doing the skills. Instructors could evaluate those um, videos. There's new um, pads coming on the market now where it's like an all-in-one pad that has multiple skills that students can work on, like injection pads, uh, urinary catheterization, um, IV. It has a, a line where you can start an IV. So, again, with this, you know, um, pandemic, it's really causing us to be creative and innovative. So I think we're going to see more of that coming out um, in the next few months. There's some mobile applications, and there are also screen-based programs, which I'll show you in the following slide. Next slide. There's some mobile applications. Again, some of them are free. Some of them have a low cost. Learning Nurse has a great one for teaching students about safe medication administration. Medical Joy Works is really nice because it has full, full comprehensive simulations where the students, again, have to take care of the patient and make those um, nursing decisions and, and, and perform nursing interventions. And then Skillstat has an um, a EKG free um, software program, mobile application, where they can learn all the different rhythms, have quizzes, and they have one for ACLS also. Next slide. And then this is one where I was talking about um, teaching clinical skills via a uh, screen-based program. So for our new different program, for example, we um, purchased a license for our students for Monocare Foundation. And what that um, did for our students was it mailed them a breast model and it was associated with an online course which taught them how to do um, breast exams. Um, the breast model that was mailed to them actually had lumps in it, so they were able to identify different um, abnormalities of the breast. So that helped, that was one way of helping with the clinical skills. Next slide. 
And then this is a great program, too. This is absolutely free. It's called um, Next Gen U, and it's actually a health course. And it's really meant for orientation for health care providers in a team setting. So there's scenarios, there's quizzes, there's even a certificate that students can uh, display once they're done. And it really teaches them the full aspect of taking care of a patient that has COVID. And there's other modules that happen to be um, one of the most popular ones right now, the COVID-19 uh, module. Next slide. And then, obviously, as our students um, start to go back to clinical, and also during the pandemic, we actually had students going back to the hospital setting where most of the patients had COVID. So we had to quickly um, educate our students and give them a refresher on, you know, caring for um, patients with uh, on um, precautions, how to don PPE and doff PPE. So this is one program that's available online and could be assigned to students before they come back to clinical. Ten minutes is screen based. Again, it's fun, it's engaging, and it goes over um, the CDC guidelines for sharing for patient with COVID 19. Next slide. We also did um, our own training for our students because, as you know, hospitals have various protocols and might be different. Um, and we also had to make it uh, adaptions because when this first came out, we didn't have PPE. We couldn't follow the CDC guidelines of changing your mask every time you. Um, were in a patient's room. So we had to do some um, just-in-time training that really, you know, was being updated almost on a weekly basis. So we did this via Zoom, and then we created a toolkit that is available that people can download, and it has um, videos and um, information, website, resources, quizzes that students can take just to prepare them as they go back into the clinical setting. Next slide. And then um, also you want to remember, we still want to evaluate students. Just like we did when they were in person simulation, we can still do that um, remotely with simulation. Um, with our standardized patient cases, we were still able to use our evaluation rubric, which is exactly what you see here. With standardized patients, we're able to evaluate the student. Um, you can do this with um, other cases too, simulation. It doesn't have to be standardized patients. To write feedback, our standardized patients were able to give feedback to the students, give formative feedback. And a lot of these screen-based programs, like I mentioned before, they, they actually will um, give the students uh, a computer-generated evaluation with a grade, tells them the areas where they were strong at, which areas they need to work on. Um, when we do the screen-based simulations, we're able to still have our debriefing, just like we would if we were in person. If it was a, a facilitator, um, again, you can use whatever method you use. We use pearls, other um, DML, and you're able to do that. You just do it via Zoom. And then regular debriefing is success. Next slide. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, and one of the uh, ones I recommend is definitely um, SSA, Society for Simulation and Healthcare, and also a national, which is the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation Learning. Um, and they have um, a tab that says COVID-19. If you click on there, you'll find everything to articles, to um, webinars. And these are, these are a list of webinars that are currently available. They're short to the point that very, very well done. There's also resources on application. There's a great, um, about three pages now, of an ongoing list of all the resources to simulate uh, for remote learning, for state based simulation programs, great descriptions, and tells you if they have the cost or not. All this is available on and also on the SSH website. Next slide. Again, as far as resources, these are the well, websites that have a lot of uh, resources out there for educators, um, and that's the page one, and that's what we talked about, even the National League for Nursing, Houston, uh, Quality and Safety Education for Nurses Institute, again, there's many more, but I would say these are some of the uh, best places to start if you're looking for resources. Next slide. And one thing I also want to note is that this is a great time. As we're looking at our curriculum and we're advancing and making changes, it's a good time to also look at ways that we can promote diversity and stimulation. We're in a new, we're in a time period where we know we have to do a better job at making sure our students are prepared for taking care of diverse populations. We need to do a better job at, you know, having simulations that may focus on health disparities and um, health inequities. And one of the things that, um, um, we did we're really cognizant about is making sure it's just the way our simulation centers work. We're thinking about, you know, the ethnicities of our mannequins. We have a mixture. I have 
you know, uh, Latino mannequins, for African Americans, or Caucasian, or, or a mixture, even when it comes down to our cash trainers, because it's such an important message for students that we are, we're cognizant, we're looking at this, we're making sure that even our mannequins are diverse, that's the right term for our students. Um, as we develop these cases, and so just thinking about the biases and our scenarios, I know we did a project that I worked on where it was the typical black, you know, patient had hypertension, diabetes, overweight, we had, there was even an indigenous person that you know, was suffering from alcohol abuse, and, and it was just a really, you know, the typical stereotype that we read about or the teachers do. So we just got to make sure we don't, we don't want to send the wrong message that all of patients of certain race will have all these types of stereotypes. because it's not true. So just being mindful when we create these scenarios and these cases that we're not putting on our own biases into the um, cases that we're writing them. And consider our cultural considerations on the patient background. Life for our patients. They're not just a name and a date of birth and a medical record number. Give them a life. Give them a culture. Give them a religion. Give them a language. Give them, you know, what is their spiritual or cultural consideration for their care. Building that into each scenario that we do. And on top of that, make sure students are paying attention. Maybe when we develop our pre simulation assignments, we have questions that are specifically geared to that cultural consideration. And then also thinking about a simulation. And, you know, they all don't have to be focused on a medical problem. Maybe some of them, the main learning outcome is really addressing that cultural awareness of that patient. And, you know, you can have to go for a scenario where it's a, a Muslim patient who is now facing end of life and kind of, you know, what are some of the considerations based on the person's religion or culture. So we know those into our curriculum. Next slide. So some of the lessons learned, you know, since March going through this, um, Make sure that when we're selecting these activities, they really still should be based on what are the learning outcomes, what are our objectives, not just because they're fun and cool and, you know, students are going to enjoy it, but they really should be tied to the learning outcomes that we had even before COVID and to our lives. Um, one thing that's taught us, you got to be creative and think outside the box. And sometimes plan A doesn't work. You have to be flexible to go to plan B, and things change. We're opening in September. Guess what? We may have to close again once the flu and November comes in enough. Um, use your resources. They're out there. You do not have to reinvent the wheel. And a lot of them, like I said, are free. You just have to kind of go through it and pick what's worth for your program. And be prepared. There's going to be a lot of technical glitches. I can't tell you how many times Zoom has went out and the audio's not there. Or, you know, so just be prepared. And, and we have a backup. We always have our, another person on that can help with technical issues that can help facilitate collaboration. We're all trying to do the same thing. Why not reach out to each other to see what other schools are doing? You can get great ideas from each other. And lastly, take a look at, you know, what are we going to keep? Like I said, we were forced to go into this remote virtual simulation, but we realized this is very helpful. And even as we come back, we're still going to maintain this computer-based program or this hybrid simulation or even use a standardized patient from home. We don't have to have them come in if they don't want to. Um, so what's that balance that we need? So that is all I have. The next slide has my contact information in case anybody has any questions or wants to contact me. Next slide. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Zia Daniel. And in addition to building my program of research as a postdoctoral fellow, I've worked as a clinical instructor during the pandemic since the university was required to transition online. Um, of course, this transition was not without its challenges, but the ability to conduct high-quality virtual simulations was, and still is, absolutely necessary for our students' success. Next slide, please. So with that being said, I'm going to move forward with the virtual simulation demonstration, which is based on my personal experiences as a clinical instructor at Emory University. I'll start by providing a few quick tips, then I'll introduce you to a great resource, and finally I'll dive into the virtual simulation demonstration where I walk you through a few examples. Next slide, please. Engaging students in a virtual simulation is obviously a concern because you want the students to gain the most from this experience. So here are a few tips. It's important that you set expectations for your students at the beginning of the simulation. Give an overview of the simulation, tell them how the simulation will flow, and let them know their participation is required. You may want to provide supplemental materials for the students to prepare the virtual simulation beforehand. Simulations are usually content-specific, so it increases meaningful participation when students are able to read up on the specific topic. 
They can provide links to websites or YouTube videos, too. Evidence-based practice is consistently reinforced in nursing, so you can also provide research articles for, for preparation. Unless planned and intentional, silence during the virtual simulation can be awkward. One way to prevent that is to be prepared to ask discussion questions. For example, you can ask students to speak about their experiences related to that topic or ask follow-up questions to their responses to your questions. And one last thing to consider, students love when we talk about our experiences in the clinical setting as it relates to the virtual simulation. For them, it answers some of those what if and in real life questions that students so often have. So I encourage you to share your professional clinical experiences as much as possible to help them become familiar with the application of what you're teaching. In addition to the NACSO that I mentioned earlier, the National League of Nursing offers a wonderful resource where they've compiled a list of virtual simulations, both free and for purchase. The link to the PDF is embedded here, so you can click on it for access once the slides are published. And so here is a preview of the NLM's PDF to show you some of their resources. These are the free resources. And they also have listed resources that also purchase. In addition to providing a detailed simulation resource, the NLM has professional de development programs, which includes their initiative called Advancing Care Excellence, or ACE. ACE provides programs um, that are free, and they are teacher-ready curriculum tools that address the vulnerable populations listed here. So the first link on the slide will take you to the ACE webpage. When you scroll down, you'll see ACE unfolding case catalog right here. And when you click on that, you'll see a list of the cases offered that are specific to the vulnerable population. Below that is the ACE teaching strategy catalog here. And that provides teaching strategies for each, um, I'm sorry, and that link provides teaching strategies for each vulnerable population, as you can see here. Within each of these teaching strategy links, you'll find more links for reading and the videos for students to review. You'll find learning activities, including discussion questions, group work, and role play scenarios, depending on the teaching strategy. Uh, the, the next link takes you to the Millie Larson unfolding case. For that case, you will find, and with all the cases, you'll find many files available for you to download, from audio files to a template for running the simulation to the patient's medical chart information. Each case is designed for you to modify for your first one. I taught this case with another faculty member, and we chose to focus on how older patients present with UTIs to the ED and the course of their hospital stay. We introduced the case with the audio monologue from, from Millie Larson. We discussed the situation and reviewed each of her medications. My colleague and I played different roles throughout the simulation to give the students somewhat of a real-life experience and we assigned assessments for the students to perform and have them verbalize their actions. For example, the students will verbalize knocking on the patient's door, performing hand hygiene, and putting on gloves. Uh, then the students introduced themselves to the patients, and we, as the faculty, proceeded to interact with the students as the patient, Millie Larson, and the patient's daughter, Gina. We responded to the students based on their actions, questions, and comments. My responses as Millie Larson were typical of how older patients with UTIs present with altered mental status, and my colleagues' responses were typical of how concerned family members may act who have never seen their loved ones behave in this manner. We acted out the scenarios listed here, but keep in mind that they can be modified or combined to fit the amount of time you have allotted for the simulation. Going, to back, going back to what I mentioned earlier about the supplemental materials, we have the students review the pathophysiology for UTI. Uh, as a discussion question to keep the conversation moving, you can ask questions about um, catheter-associated UTIs or CAUTI and have them review the implications and prevention strategies for CAUTI. We ended with care planning and discharge planning for Miller Larson. But the next slide um, demonstration, it highlights the 
ARISE simulation from Chippewa Valley Technical College. ARISE stands for Augmented Reality Integrated Simulation Education. And these simulations focus on clinical assessment, diagnoses, and skills. The program functions as an application available in the Apple App Store, so it requires the use of an iPad or an iPhone. You will need to search ARIS in the App Store to find the app and download it. The first link on the slide takes you to the Skills Commons website where the ARIS simulations are found. They offer over 120 different simulations for different populations, and you can use the search bar at the top to search for specific content of interest to you. The next slide, the next link, I'm sorry, is for the domestic violence simulation within a therapeutic communication nursing skills resource. Uh, you can use the Arise app that you downloaded on your iPad or iPhone to scan this QR code to access the simulation. This teaching plan gives you an overview of the scenario as well as instructions on how to present this assignment to the students. Essentially, it's a game where students watch a video of a nurse giving them a report, followed by videos of the, of the patient. Uh, each, each patient video is followed by questions. And once the students select the correct answer, the in-flex style rationales are provided for each answer option. In the virtual setting, I shared my iPad screen with the students and led the simulation. I would instruct the groups of students to place their answers to the questions in the chat box, and then we would review and discuss the rationales. I'd inquire about their experience with these simulations and share mine as well. Some of the videos from these simulations are available on YouTube. And that's where the last link on the slide will take you. And this is through OpenRN Project's YouTube page. Uh, it has a few of the full playlists for the ARISE simulation. And you can see here, uh, they have the different playlists for the different simulations. And then the domestic violence one that I just mentioned, uh, if you click view full playlist, you will see here, uh, all of the videos come up for that particular simulation. Okay. For ease of access, you can take these video links and embed them into a PowerPoint presentation to guide the students through the simulation. The next virtual simulation example is the Virtual Healthcare Experience Portal, which was created by Centennial College. Ryerson University and George Brown College. It's set up like a hospital with different units, including the emergency department, maternal and child health, med surge, mental health, and pediatrics. The link on this slide takes you to the introductory, introductory page for the simulation. And this is what that website looks like. And once again, in the virtual setting, this is another simulation where you share your screen and have the students choose the next step or answer. When you click Enter, you can choose which area of the hospital you want to focus on. I'll choose Med Surge for this example. And keep in mind that this simulation uses best practices by the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative, so feel free to provide supplemental information that relates to your state and your local institution's policy. You'll begin with a new game. You'll click play game and begin with a new game. And real live videos, once you click play simulation, real live videos are shown from the nurse's perspective. The videos present issues that occur in the clinical setting and then ask how you will respond. You click on the response that the students, the students choose and the video will continue regardless of which choice is selected. The simulation doesn't immediately tell you if your answer is correct, but instead it plays out based on the chosen response, and then it provides feedback. At that point, if the response was incorrect, the students are able to try again, and if they answer correctly, the scenario continues. At the end of the simulation, you're able to download a progress summary uh, for your students, and that details the questions asked and the responses given by the students. The last simulation is the Turbulent Sky Simulation by Red River College and ETD Learning Technologies. 
This exercise is a disaster management scenario that provides a simulation that gives students an idea of the nurse's role in a disaster. The theory supporting the different cases presented, a quiz to review the simulation skills learned, and a debrief exercise. So there are lots of videos embedded with, within this simulation. And the link here saying go to Turbulent Sky will take you into the actual disaster scenario. Basically, the scenario, the disaster scenario, um, in this disaster scenario, what happened was um, there was an airplane that experienced a hard landing because the wheels would not descend from the airplane, and it caused several injuries. So this video will give you an overview of the entire disaster area. And the question mark at the bottom right-hand corner beside the map will help identify what the icons mean as you work through the scenario. The arrows take you to a specific location, and the portals take you to the disaster activities. And the videos provide an in-depth look at what's going on in that area. And then you can click up here on Turbulent Sky at the top left-hand corner to return to the home screen. And this is where you find and access all the other materials I mentioned earlier. So in conclusion, I want to encourage you to explore the sites I've shown you in this demonstration, as well as the others listed on NLM's rich resource. There are lots of opportunities for you to provide high-quality simulations that align with your curriculum to support your students as we navigate this unpredictable new normal. Thank you. And now I'll turn it back over to Dr. DeWitty for the Q&A session, where we'll be happy, I'll be happy to answer any questions along with my colleagues about the virtual simulation. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you to our speakers for such a dynamic presentation. And I'm not so sure about you, but I do a lot of new learning this afternoon. And we are now open for any questions that you might have uh, for any of our guest speakers. You can put them in the chat box, or either you might uh, decide to uh, press star six on your telephone to unmute yourself to ask a question. I think everyone was just really, really amazed. Uh, with the with the outstanding presentation, I would like to uh, ask a question um, of both uh, Dr. Bryant and Dr. Uh, Daniel as to um, how have students responded to this innovative uh, approach to um, to virtual simulation. Overall, how have students responded to that? Dr. Bryant, can you hear me? Sure, we certainly can. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know I was muted. Um, I can honestly say it's, it's mixed. Um, I think students appreciate, um, there's some great programs out there, and I definitely love some of the student based programs. Um, however, I think the overall arching theme that I'm getting from the students is they really want to be on campus. They really want to have that simulation experience in person in our beautiful simulation center. So I think it's kind of hard to judge. Yes, this is great that, you know, we're providing this, um, but they still miss that hands-on, you know. So that's, we just did our evaluations, and so that's kind of just the broad feedback that we're getting. Yes, so certainly we, we all enjoy and prefer to be with each other. Uh, any of our other speakers had any comments about the um, about the presentations or uh, what were the takeaways that you that you uh, had? I know Dr. Brown, you mentioned a number of times that there were some takeaways and some aha moments for you in the process. Uh, what are some of the things you think you might be carrying forward? Um, Dr. Brian, again, we're, um, before COVID, we really weren't using a lot of the screen-based programs. We were just kind of evaluating them. But I would say that there's about three of them that we're using right now that we're going to continue to use um, even as we come back on campus. Um, so that was definitely a, a, a one thing that we took away, a positive that we took away from going through this. Okay. And what about what about you, Dr. Daniels? Are there any takeaways? 
Yes, well, first I wanted to respond to your first questions about how our students think this field. I, I agree with um, I agree with what was mentioned earlier. I felt that our students were apprehensive about the whole journey. Um, but as they got into it, they warmed up to it a little bit because they didn't really have an option. Of course, they wanted to be in person. But we moved forward with these simulations and then started to appreciate them. I um, personally sent out a brief survey to my students as, after each simulation to get some feedback on how to make it stronger. And so that helped me build um, my program. Uh, in addition to that, though, the students, I think they realized how helpful these experiences were. These experiences were. Um, I even had one student comment on the fact that the information that she learned in the simulation uh, was asked in her job interview, and and the people interviewing her were very impressed that she was able to answer. So um, one of the takeaways from this whole thing was finding ways to encourage students to keep moving forward and highlight ways that would advance them as nurses uh, once they get into the clinical setting. Okay. Thank you so very much for those for those comments. We have a couple of other questions that are coming to the chat box. The question that we have comes from uh, Tabitha Robinson, who would like to know, did uh, you incorporate any care planes or concept maps in addition to virtual simulation, or what they based on the, on the simulation themselves. This is and I think that's a great idea. We, um, like I said, most of the, all of my programs are graduate level, even though we do have an accelerated RM program. So, no, we did not use any fair plans or concept maps, but I definitely feel that that could be incorporated into, into these virtual simulations. Okay. And um, Dr. Daniels, did you use uh, any uh, care plans or concept maps uh, in addition to the simulations that you worked with? Uh, yes, we created care plans um, to support the, the simulations that we worked with. Okay. And then we made right. sure that... <laughs> And we made sure that um, our objections match back to the students. Okay. All right. Uh, and we had one, um, an additional recommendation from, um, from Evelyn Hoover who indicated that she wanted to add another uh, resource from the University of Michigan, Outbreak at Watersedge, which is an independent game for epidemiology. So that's another one that you can add to your list. A number of persons asked about um, the web link for the recording, and uh, that has been placed in the chat box. It is www.campaignforaction.org backslash webinar, and it will be available within um, seven to ten days, within the week. So, um, once again, I would like to really give an abundance of thanks to our three outstanding presenters this afternoon uh, who really did enrich us and provide with, I think, some wonderful resources uh, which should help us all as we move forward trying to return to campus in these uncertain times and not knowing what the outcomes might be once we get into, into the fall season. So this webinar will be available, and um, please make sure that you access it and share it with others. We would like to thank the uh, Future of Nursing Campaign for Action uh, for uh, presenting this webinar on our behalf. We ask that you follow us on Twitter or join us on Facebook, and do sign up for the bi-weekly campaign update, which is also on um, campaign for action website. And with that, I would like to close us down for this afternoon. We appreciate your joining us. We thank our speakers once again. And please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.